Hey everyone, welcome to Crushing Classical, redefining a thriving classical music career. I'm Tracy Friedlander, and today I have Mark Rabideau joining me on the show. Mark is a trombone performer and teacher and currently the director of the 21st Century Musician Initiative at DePauw University, which is both an online resource for classical musicians of today, as well as an organization to support musicians to connect and create in interesting ways in their community. On the show, Mark and I talk about his career path. Starting from his narrow focused goal, he only saw one possible job for himself and his one backup plan that was possible. And he tells the story of what happened when he did not get that dream job. What happened is he created a dream career that, and he takes us through the journey, how he got there. From devastation to his awakening, he describes the arduous process of discovering what a unique career would look like for him. Before we begin, a couple of quick things. Please join the conversation at facebook.com slash crushing classical as well as crushing classical on Instagram. If you love our content, it would mean the world to us for you to comment and share it with your classical musician friends and colleagues. Also, join us next week for the Crushing Classical Starting Line Challenge starting Monday, December 11th. During this challenge, you will explore creating your unique career and what that can look like. Whether you are on an audition path have a job and want to create a side hustle, or you want to do your own thing, this challenge is for you. Join us at facebook.com slash group slash CC starting line challenge. The link is included in the show notes. I'd also like to thank Fix Music for being a sponsor of Crushing Classical Podcast. Fixmusic.com is your online resource for affordable, high-quality sheet music. Fix also offers unique buying options for individuals, teachers, and schools. Whether you have a large private teaching studio or you run a music program, Fix has a solution for you. Contact them through their website for more information. Fix also offers priority and priority express shipping at super affordable rates, meaning they do not pad their shipping rates to make more money. If you need sheet music fast, Fix will expedite it to you as inexpensively as possible. Also, remember to use the discount link in the show notes and get 10% off your order. Let's get started. Hey, Mark, how are you? I'm good. I'm good, Tracy. Thanks for uh beaming me into your show today. <laughs> beaming you up. Thanks for being on the show. So I'm so excited that you're here. You know, I, I know from our previous conversations and seeing you online and everything that you have created such an extraordinary music career as a trombone player and teacher. And now you're doing so much more in your career that we'll get into a little bit later. And I'm excited about that too. But first, I want to dive into where it all began for you, because I really related to you know, the Chicago beginnings, you had a teacher in Chicago that you studied with. Um, and so tell me about that. So you, you grew up in, in the Chicago area and you studied with um, Frank Christofoli, correct? Well, no, actually, I, I, you know, I grew up on the East Coast. Oh, and, you did. Okay. And my earliest mentor is, is Dave Sporny. And Dave was the, um, the trombone professor at Interlock and Arts Academy for for a couple of decades. He started the jazz program there. He's just an astonishing artist, musician, and and more than anything else, mentor. And, and he moved out to the University of Massachusetts while I was still in high school. Okay. And a friend of mine had had said, "Listen, you know, there's a new guy coming around here. You've got to connect with him." And and so I studied studied with Dave Sporny in high school, <clears throat> and. And still regard him as the most significant person in my musical life. Um, and when I say my musical life, I mean life lived through the arts. Somebody whose yeah. lessons were much greater than alternate slide positions and, <laughs> you know, your lips. Um, but uh, Dave Sporny went to the University of Illinois <clears throat> um, as an undergrad and as actually as a grad student too. And when I was thinking about <clears throat> where I would begin my undergraduate studies, I, he was just such a hero of mine. I thought, well, that's exactly where I'll go. So I went to the University of Illinois as an undergraduate student. And then from there, I went and studied with Frank Crisofulli in my master's program. Okay. So that, you know, my, my Illinois connections come through an early mentor and then funnel their way in. Once you, once you're in the, the, you know, the, the radius of Chicago and you're really thinking seriously about a life as a brass player, which is probably exactly the way I was thinking of my life at the time as, mm-hmm. as I, I'm a brass player and, and I'm a trombonist, then of course, Chicago is, is the hands down Mecca for 
for brass playing and orchestral brass playing and Frank Cristofoli was was the exemplar for that. So for me, I just had to be um, had to be studying with him. And you know, when I was in my undergraduate years, I was there uh, with Paul Merkello, who's of course a principal trumpet player uh, in the Montreal Symphony Orchestra. Paul was a really young guy, younger than me, and and we used to take road trips together from Champaign Urbana up uh, 57 North, and we we'd go to the Italian Village. You know, this was the cool. <laughs> New when we that were. was the place. Oh my gosh, we used to go there after Chicago Youth or- uh, Orchestra concerts and stuff. Is that place well, still there? I don't know if it is still there. Not like you know. Of course, now I, I mean, I've you know, my my much more elegant and Chicago uh, wife Laura would would probably want something more like Spiaggio's or something like that. But yeah. but you know, the Italian Village felt very very upscale to a nineteen year old. And, yeah, and so. We, we would go there and then we'd go over and, and watch the CSO play. And then we'd talk about it, you know, the, the three hour trip um, each way, you know, how excited we were to hear the concert and how blown away we were. And so, so, you know, Paul and I were both just enamored with the CSO and, yeah. and, and so that was my path towards Frank Christopher. Awesome. And so then how did you end up studying with him? Um, I feel very, very lucky to have studied with Mr. C and, and, it, you can't find a single student who ever passed through his studio that wouldn't say the same. But my, my path was a little bit different than I think that I had planned um, and different than most. Um, I was graduating the University of Illinois, absolutely loved my time there, actually chose to, to later go back <clears throat> and get a doctorate there. Um, but I knew I was going to study with Frank Christopher so I applied to Northwestern and everything looked promising. And at that time, um, a, a very good friend of mine uh, had been studying horn at Northwestern. And she had an incredible experience with that, which she went to go do study with Dale Clevenger. Mm-hmm. Um, but her, her experience on that campus was a little bit mixed. And it's, that's not, I think, the typical story. It's, it's an amazing institution with producing so many tremendous artists and brass players specifically. Um, but, but I did get a little shy at the end there about whether this place would be precisely best for me. Uh, part of that was a financial worry. I'm from a big mm-hmm. family, uh, nine kids tucked within 10 years and two months. Uh, this will be my first of many, I assure you, asides that uh, I have all these siblings that were all huddled in within 10 years of each other. And at this very moment, uh, we're in a little tiny window where we're all 50 something. We're all the same decade. So I have a sibling that's 50, 51, 52, 53, 50, wow. rah, rah, 50. Yeah. And we actually all gather with it undying commitment of getting nine kids and a mom and a dad who are both in their eighties at this point to get together. And so next weekend, actually I'm heading out to Cape May, New Jersey and all nine siblings will actually make it. But we probably only achieve that once a decade. And this is the window that we commit to that. Um, and so growing up in a family um, where we did not have means at all um, mm-hmm. later in our work, we'll talk about <clears throat> some of my projects and how they're maybe a little bit different than, other projects being pursued, and a lot of that is is remembering back what it meant to, to be a kid in a big family um, without a lot of resources. My entire right. childhood was a welfare kid. Um, my my father was um, not working as a kid, and probably uh, depressed for sure, and maybe even um, suffering from bipolar disorder at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, really, a family with very little means. And thinking about that big tuition bill and thinking about whether I was going to truly hit my kind of happy, focused, one-year groove at Northwestern, Mr. Christopher Foley recommended to me um, another option, and that was to study at the University of Notre Dame, where he also taught. Oh. And so so my path kind of in May was to send a decline to Northwestern and and accept to um, to Notre Dame. And uh, and it, it proved to be a great fit for me. Uh, very different campus with very different resources and very different uh, depth. Um, but it was an opportunity to study with Mr. Christopher Foley for two years mm. and, and an opportunity also where where the financial burden that all students have to reckon with um, was was shifted pretty dramatically. Yeah. And I bet that growing up like that, I, I'm really curious to hear how that affected you. Um, going through your career, you know, like 
as you audition and just the the fears of of knowing how hard it is to make it quote unquote in this mm -hmm. um field that that must have weighed on your on your mind the financial concerns well you, you know what this this is an outstanding point and truth be told uh everybody should consider um all of that equation universities mm -hmm. are big commitment in every way you know all of your resources time energy money mind space um but i was really narrow in my thinking i i didn't worry about the financial piece i i think i worried about it in like very isolated moments but um but growing up my, you know my family's probably a different story maybe many people coming out of my family you think well maybe he's a first college generation kid and that's not the case at all both my parents have master's degree my dad uh, studied beyond his master's degree uh, to do the coursework for a doctorate. My oldest brother, who, you know, for much of my childhood was just my hero, um, has a doctorate in economics and taught at Swarthmore. Um, but then probably half of my siblings never even considered going to college or maybe had a very fleeting, you know, one semester foray with it and decided that it wasn't really for them. So it was, there was a real mixed sense of, of commitment to education. But as long as those student loans were being um, <laughs> funneled my way, I, I, I never really, I think growing up as poor as I grew up, I had no sense of what a $30,000 or a $50,000 loan looked like. It just, you know, as my, <laughs> I, I remember as a kid, um, you know, we, we all had little savings accounts that I imagine we're just talking about 10 or $15 in there. And realizing one day that my dad, in order just to feed our family, had to wipe them all out. And, and I get that. Uh, he had a whole bunch of, uh, uh, coins from his dad that had real value to them. And, and he just spent them as, you know, face value, right? Wow. Um, silver dollars as dollars. And part of it was just, uh, you know, kind of desperation of the moment, I imagine. But those lessons for me, made me realize that I, I never thought about my financial future at that time. I didn't think about saving and I didn't think about spending. I thought about what do I want to do next? And my path was at that point, like leaving undergrad and heading north to study with Mr. Chris Foley was all about winning the job that I knew he would soon, uh, you know, open up. Interesting. About, and so, right. Yeah. yeah. And that's interesting because you said, okay, this guy is offering me an option to take in, take lessons with him for two years instead of one at Northwestern. So that, so you were, you were being a little strategic there too. Like, Hey, I have him for longer if I do this for my money, yeah, I think, essentially. Yeah, in my mind. Yeah. And that was one of the things I think worried a lot of us about Northwestern is the one year masters. Could you get it all done in that time? And, but, yeah. you know, probably I already should have been the financial mm -hmm. source from, you know, putting out a lot of money for a great education that, you know, if you can do it is, is a great investment versus at Notre Dame. I was, you know, I was all of that giant tuition was covered. Um, plus a stipend that I could actually live on. That was, that was like my third priority. My, my first priority was studying with him for two years. Um, and my second priority was, um, where I felt I could personally be in a good space so that I could make as much progress as possible. And, Notre Dame just seemed incredibly welcoming and and um, and opening, uh, open to 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 my participation there. So I just it just felt like boy, I'll I'll have two years, I'll be in a great spot, and and I will yeah. win that. <laughs> you, so you you had your mind made up. You wanted you wanted Mr. C's job in the CSO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's that's and and I think that, you know I was probably. The, the really, uh, well, I imagine there are many people in this spot, but, but it's not the person I am today. It was, it was a very kind of laser myopic view of what was possible in my life. Mm -hmm. I had invested all of my blood, sweat and tears in the practice room towards the most narrow of goals. The second chair in the trombone section of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. It wasn't even like I wanted to be an orchestral or a trombonist or I wanted to be you know, it was incredibly narrow and, right. and I'm so to still remember what that feels like because there, there is a lot of time and energy and isolation that you experience, um, preparing for a life, uh, as an orchestral player. And, 
my world is so radically different than that. But I, I there's no question about it. When I went to, to win that job and when I learned that I did not win that job and that I lost that job to a young Australian with a great accent and a, and a better <laughs> sound, um, that, that was an incredible moment of, of both reckoning, but also of, of awakening. And, okay. you know, and it, for me, that's a really exciting thing to have experienced and also to, to still remember what that feels like when I think about young people today. Yeah. So yeah. tell me about the, tell me about what you mean by awakening. So I'm sure there was a disappointment at first, right? When you, when you realized you didn't win. Oh, there's, I think it's more than disappointment. It's devastation, right? Okay. I mean, and, and I, I think that's, you know, part of the message is that, you know, that, that there's an enormous amount of pressure on anyone. Yeah. If you think of any one audition being the definition of your own life's success, the weight of that yeah. just sounds, it yeah. sounds so burdensome to me. I, I'm so thankful that there's not any one moment in my life where I think it fully defines me. Right. Um, you know, I mean, it, and some of that just comes with age. I'm, I'm not 23 anymore. Yeah. Um, and some of that goes through, <clears throat> through these hard moments and, and our own ability to be resilient and to, to redirect and, uh, to repurpose, um, our talents and our, skills and our mindsets um, away from that one moment. But of course, yes, when that one moment comes down, you know, where you just, it, it all comes crap. And I can share as many failure stories as you need for your listeners, um, <laughs> where, where, whether it was with, for the CSO or um, <clears throat> a little later in life when I was auditioning to be the trombone professor at the University of Washington in Seattle. And I, I just nailed every part of that interview and that my teaching and all of it. And then I got on that recital stage and I just, I can't even, I sounded like I was in fifth grading and all, you know, oh. and you walk away and think, how, how do those happen? I mean, I'm not a, a choke player, but th we put so much weight on those moments. And the truth yeah. is sometimes you don't deliver. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So, um, so you, you said you had, I really like what you said about having an awakening, like right kind of soon after that audition for the Chicago Symphony, but um, take me back to like right after, so right after you're devastated. And yeah. then how did you, how were you able to get from devastation to awakening? Cause that is a huge gap between devastation and awakening, you know, and awakening is almost like the, the pinnacle of a place to be when you're looking at what's possible in your career. So how do you get from devastation to awakening? Boy, Trace, that's such a, I appreciate that question because <clears throat> I've never really thought about it in that framework. And, <laughs> and really, I'm thinking of two moments. Okay. Um, but for me, it was about going back home and, and maybe all that goes with going back home. So, so, um, you know, I was devastated by it. And what I decided to do was to kind of take a gap year. I hadn't taken any kind of break from schooling. And, uh, you know, I wrapped up my master's degree and I, I went back, uh, home for a year and I went back home, uh, not, not to my mom and dad's place, but rather I lived with a younger brother who I'd been thinking about, about a lot and even worrying a little bit about. Um, and my older brother, one of my older brothers, Thomas, who's a really crazy creative person. And so I lived with two of my brothers and, and one of my very best friends. And I went and studied again with Dave Sporny. I wanted to go back to, to the guy that had showed me initially that I can do this, that mm -hmm. I, that this, this is something that's, that's part of my future and part of my DNA. And uh, so I went back and I, I took a class or two at the university of Massachusetts thinking about whether or not I wanted to redirect. I only saw two options in life, win that job in the CSO or be a high school band director. And, mm. and, and that seems so, uh, myopic. And, and it, remember that for me, that was all of a sudden I was expanding my palette, right? I'd, I only yeah. saw one, as, you know, in the, in the, in the, you know, as an option. And all of a sudden I'm saying, well, maybe, maybe just like the Academy tells us, you're either a performer or you're, you're a music educator. Maybe I'm a music educator. Mm -hmm. So I took a couple classes and 
really had a great experience doing them and, and actually loved it, but realized it wasn't for me. It wasn't what I was going to do. And so I'd kind of answered that question, but I'd also answered the question about, about home and family and, and, and kind of reconnected to, to my roots a little bit. And I, I say it like that because uh, later in life, going through a much more significant crisis, much more profound crisis, a um, really good friend of mine, Joe Farnsworth, who some of your listeners will know is, you know, arguably one of the, you know, great, great jazz drummers alive today, you know, plays for McCoy, Tyner and Pharaoh Sanders and, and, you know, and, and uh, Eric Alexander, he's in the all for one, one for all group there. And, you know, great. And, and I remember going through after I go through my divorce and talking to Joe, he said, um, you know, go back to your roots and, and find that big hearted Mark Rabideau that, you know, that everybody mm. loves. Him. And so for me, I think it was, it was going back to my roots a little bit. And some of that was just getting recentered and, and learning a little bit more about Mark Rabideau and a little bit more about um, what I really do offer the, the world. And, and, um, and to understand that it wasn't as narrowly defined as winning any one audition mm. or, 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 or deciding to jump off of my dream train and, and hop onto a backup plan and, and just to accept that as, as truth. Right. And, um, yeah. So for me, that was a great year. And so I decided I was going to go back and get a doctorate. Uh, my brother was, my oldest brother, Paul is still my hero. And, he has a doctorate and I, and I was learning how to be a good student finally after, uh, you know, barely getting through high school, a pretty mediocre academic career and undergraduate, uh, a little bit better in my master's. I was just starting to get my traction a little bit and started thinking about bigger ideas and thought maybe a doctorate was a good idea. And, and then from there, actually, I got derailed just for a semester. Somebody gave me a call and asked me to be a sabbatical replacement um, in Arkansas at Arkansas State University. And so I, I thought, well, this is even better. I'll, I'll delay the, the doctorate for a semester and I'll teach for a semester and see how I like that. And I, yeah. I liked it quite a lot. It was, it wasn't what they told me was going to be. There were, uh, you know, little difference in, in what I agreed to do and what they asked me to do there. But, but I did enjoy being on a college campus. I grew up in a college town. I'd been on college campuses for the past, past bunch of years. And I thought maybe, maybe this is a parallel path that I can pursue. Keep mm -hmm. on auditioning. Um, Okay, so you Keep were keeping on auditioning. You 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 decided you wanted to try again, somewhere. Yeah, what I what I decided was that I think that was uh, so. That I don't think we've hit awakening yet, but I think we've Ooh. hit a, an opening of the lens. Okay, where I kind of reconnected with myself and reconnected with a few other possibilities, and decided that there wasn't the plan and the backup plan, but rather um, there was a plan unfolding as I was going. And I see. And I was kind of chasing it down from a couple of different directions now. Yeah, isn't it? Isn't it funny how we always define it? Like there's either this thing we can do or that thing. I can do this or I can do that. And like without realizing, there's kind of a spectrum. And it oh, looks like, so, yeah. yeah, looks like that's what you were discovering. Yeah, and and that's really if I fast forward it a bit, that's that is what happened over the next few years. Is is this kind of opening of the aperture. So I, you know, I taught for a semester down at Arkansas State. You know, I was hired to be the trombone professor. I learned about two or three days in after nobody else showed up to a marching band rehearsal that I was asked to help with, that indeed I was the marching band director, which was interesting. <laughs> Not, um, but all of a sudden I realized, you know, that aperture was opening. I, I went and uh, got a doctorate at the University of Illinois, uh, say with uh, Elliot Chazanov there. At, so there's a Back to an old place, but with a very different um, uh, person uh, mentoring me along and uh, learned a whole, whole lot about the trombone during that time and and, and learned more. Um, I turned down the trombone assistantship and, and took the jazz TA that was offered to me. And What had you do the, that? What had you do that? Because that, the assistantship sort of seems like maybe the path to a professorship. Somewhere down mm -hmm. the line. So, what had you choose choose jazz at that moment? I, I think two things, uh, or a couple of things. One is, um, you know, I was already realizing that those, if if I ended up going down the kind of the professorial route, that that you needed to be, you needed to have a bigger definition than I just play the trombone well. 
Mm. And I thought, well, this would be great. I mean, I'm going to play the trombone well, and I have a great uh, mentor now in, in Elia Chazanoff. And, um, and, and I can expand what I can offer. So that positions, you know, I think the, the thing about that marching band experience there, which was uh, both horrifying and comedic, um, <laughs> was that institutions need people who can do a few things pretty, pretty darn well, and, and at least one thing really, really well. Right. And I think more likely for me, as I, as I started looking at what kinds of positions were, were on the opening on the market that, you know, maybe being able to say that, listen, I can run a big band. I could teach improvisation. Um, I could play the trombone and teach the trombone. Maybe that bigger offering um, was helpful. And maybe when I went back to my roots a little bit and realized that, you know, in high school, I, I saw this big wide opening of, you know, I was playing jazz and I was playing orchestral music and I was working on solo stuff and I was, you know, really excited about new music. And, you know, I'd, I'd kind of narrowed myself through my undergraduate years and, People were telling you, hey, listen, you know, stay focused on this one thing. Don't get distracted by these other things. At that point, I started realizing, you know, the freedom that's experienced in taking a jazz soul, the freedom that's experienced in, in, you know, you know, kind of being on a gig where it's kind of all about the raw excitement and really engaging an audience at that moment um, was something you could carry over into your other uh, playing that, you know, was talked about as more refined and crafted and that these things were mutually informing and expansive. And I, I really wanted to explore that in my own playing. I wanted to explore that and what I could offer the field. So it sound, to me, it sounds like you, the, the path to, from devastation to awakening, there's, there's some discovery going on, you know, like some, on some level you realize, wait a second, I'm allowed to discover other things. You know, a lot of times people wouldn't even be open to discovering. Well, I know for me, like, I could have taken jazz improvisation at IU, like everyone raved about the class. And I just yeah. was a no to it because, oh, I have to practice, you know, like ridiculous. I was so narrow, narrowly focused. And again, like you said, you were narrowly focused at that age, too. And that's what I was doing. But um, it's it's cool to see that, like, in in the path on the way to this uh, awakening that you were you were really discovering what what kind of other things interested you and and you were able to not listen to other people that were saying hey you sh you need to focus on this or that you were like wait maybe these things actually um help help those things i should be focusing on to be better you, you know there's there's a lot there i was i was just on your 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 alma mater's campus iu uh, just 2 days ago yeah, i saw that on facebook that was awesome oh it was so fun it was so great and the thing is that of course IU is, is, is a different place than when you were there. Yeah. Um, and it's, and it's evolving as it should, which is really exciting. But, you know, what was the big game changer for me? And it, it's about this awakening piece is that it's about put it being open to being outside of your comfort zone. And, and at that time, I, you know, my comfort zone was, was well celebrated. Hey, get in the practice room, learn how to play that horn. Here are the 15 excerpts you need to know. <laughs> yeah. Do it. And, you know, that's, that's, for a lot of people, still, that's incredibly comfortable. I need to know these 15 excerpts in a way that, you know, it's not that I can play them 10 times in a row without making a mistake. It's that I can't not play them 10 times in a row without making a mistake. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, what was the biggest change for me is when I, when I left Illinois, I actually joined the faculty administration at the end of my doctorate. So I finished my doctorate. I, I stayed on, uh, co-chairing the jazz division as it works out to so see that actually was a good investment. Yeah. Um, co-chaired the jazz division and ran one of the big bands and, you know, did some trombone masterclass stuff and, and, um, and I had an administrative post, which really opened up the lens a little bit to, to, to what I offered, what I, what I hope to offer the profession, just some kind of big reviews away from just Mark Rabideau, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, maybe part of my role here is not just thinking about myself, but thinking about the profession as a whole or an institution in that case. And, yeah. and um, you know, and during that window, I got married uh, to somebody who was finishing up, uh, was working on a doctorate at, at Illinois. And when, when she finished, it was time for her to go on the market. I'd been kind of functioning in the profession and, and doing pretty well and kind of growing my resume and, and so Mary P took a job at Rutgers University, uh, uh, out in New Jersey there. And, and I thought, well, okay, I, I can make a life for myself. That Northeast corridor is a really rich, interesting place. 
lots going on. And so we took a leap of faith and we moved, I, I resigned from Illinois and loved the place then and love it now. I actually had the chance to go back last year and give the commencement speech at graduation. It was such oh, wow. a humbling experience to go back to your own alma mater, a place that had given me so much and to have a chance to reflect on that and to, and to speak to the most recent graduates. And, but, um, but, but this ended up being a really, really incredibly transformative moment in my life because I had two little guys when I moved out there and another little guy soon to come. And so now all of a sudden I'm a dad of three young kids, wow. um, two young professionals um, trying to make their way. Mary P. Uh, in the English department at Rutgers University, um, trying to get tenure at an incredibly competitive, um, you know, even cutthroat environment. Mm -hmm. um, and me winning a job as the director of music business and technology and professor of trombone at a little school in Lancaster, PA, Millersville University. Okay. So, so yeah, after you decided to move, did you... Did you start researching what jobs you could apply to right away oh, or? Yeah, at this point, yeah. Matter of fact, when we arrived, I'd already won the job at Miller's. So. Okay. So you were like on top of it. As soon as you heard like she was going to go to this school and yes. she was going to go to Rutgers, you were looking around and seeing where where has openings and what can I apply for? Yeah. And and what you'll see is over my career, I've, I've, <laughs> I've done that a few times where all of a sudden like, oh, I'm moving and and I've been able to. Um, create an opportunity for myself. Yeah. And, and that's what I want to get into here because I mean, it's, it takes a certain point of view to see opportunity instead of not see it. You know, if, if you don't think there would be opportunity, you wouldn't see it. So that's the interesting well, thing about your point of view is that you were like, you were very open to what possibilities there were from the start. Well, I was in. And I, I think this is, and, and I am now, and now I have a little bit more language surrounding that about what that mindset looks like and the, how we can open our mind to those possibilities. I think at this point in my life, it was a little bit more intuitive. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, people often talk about the difference between luck and creating opportunities for yourselves. And, and there is a, there's an enormous amount of research and, and, um, ways of thinking around what it takes to invent the future for yourself that you hope to to live. Yeah. And so some of it was um not putting artificial boundaries about what it, what my life would look like in New Jersey. Right. And and not to not to have that incredibly narrow perspective that I had just just 10 years earlier about, you know, I'm either going to win a job in the CSO or I'm going to you know already forfeit what I hoped to do and, and to accept what, what I'm sure would have been a incredible. I mean, both my parents were school teachers, my mom, in the Catholic school system, my dad eventually, um, uh, early, early in his career before my childhood was a public school teacher and eventually circled back and was able to do that again late in life. Um, a real victory for him. So, um, and I just want to say, like, we should have a toast over <laughs> the fact that you went from that micro focus I can only have this job in 10 years to the Mark Rabideau who's like, there's opportunity in this place where, especially right after you just had achieved so much at U of I, and then you're getting ready to move and you have a new family. And I mean, I mean, a young family and you're yeah. like, oh my gosh, like now I have to do this again and, and I'm going to find new opportunities. And there are so many um, available. That's a big, that's a big way to go in 10 years. I mean, 10 years is kind of a long time, but also not necessarily. I mean, to go that far is what I'm saying. I just want to point out that well, it's see, pretty great. There's, there's a toast to it. <laughs> um, you know, for me, it, it, so that's the moment where if 10 years was kind of a, a slow and steady pace towards um, the best idea for me at that time, the next two or three years was exponentially productive. I, you know, I won the job at Millersville University completely coincidentally, 100% coincidentally. My parents um, had decided that they were going to move more centrally to where their family had spread out. 
and they moved five miles from that campus. Oh, wow. Um, you know, any, you know, even, even after my mom and dad said they already found a house and bought it and I, I hadn't been on Millersville's campus except for the audition. I said, well, I said, well, we'll be closer, mom, but Pennsylvania is a big state. Where are you going to exactly be? And we both got out a map and started looking and looking and looking and, you know, there's a giant state and also we're like, oh my gosh, you know, we're, so I literally would drive uh, to Millersville University and stay at my mom and dad's um, place for a couple nights and, and kind of compact all of my teaching into a, a short space and um, and then work from home the rest of the week. And so I was able to take over a really fledgling music industry studies program is what it's called and transform into music business and technology with a more entrepreneurial focus. I was able to win tenure, which made me really happy and, and kind of changes your life as an academic. Mm -hmm. But also during that window, I was asked to do a postdoc at Rutgers University. Um, and there's some irony in all of this. Um <laughs> by the person who eventually fired my ex-wife uh, <laughs> wow, and, and my best friend at the time. Um, and it was a center for creativity and I was the only musician and it wasn't housed in the music department. It was housed in, in another space on campus. And, and this is an opportunity to be around really wildly creative people thinking about problems and opportunities from very different perspectives. And a couple of the byproducts that came out of that time um, was I launched a 501c3 arts organization called Artists Now that 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 survived a decade of doing really profoundly important work uh, with learners, particularly learners at the margins, but but all the children of of the community in which that resided, and, and adult learning opportunities, a Celtic music festival that went on for a decade that was really really fun that expanded from like one evening to a week long event. Um, house parties, which I still do, that were really, really fun and exciting. I ended up launching a radio show from the Upper West Side of New York called Live from Smoke. Uh, Smoke's my favorite jazz club in New York. It's up there 104th, 105th in Broadway. And, cool. and all of a sudden I saw, you know, Mark Rabbit as, as a producer of radio, aired to 255,000 listeners a week. Um, and being the executive and artistic director of a not for profit is all a likely extension of that awakening of that we're the difference between what it means to be a musician and an artist and a musician too often we define as, as I'm a trombonist. When I was on your campus, IU the other day, about 20 kids in a smaller session introduced themselves to me. And every one of them said, you know, hi, I'm Janet. And I'm a clarinetist, yeah. you know, yeah. Dave as drummer. And they all identified with their instrument, that, their instrument, right? Yeah. And all of a sudden now I just saw myself as somebody who has had the ability to be creative. I produced a, a ballet with the American Repertory Ballet, an original work from an original score uh, for 100 Voices and my trombone quartet that was launched during that same window that, that, that also survived 10 years together and played on four continents and 35 countries and did some really remarkable recordings and other things. And so this was a time where all of a sudden – I saw myself as somebody who could invent the future that they wanted. And that, um, that mindset was incredibly freeing. And as it proved soon enough to be incredibly, uh, useful, um, my ex-wife, Mary P did not get tenure at Rutgers and announced one day that, that we were moving and that we were moving to Laramie, Wyoming. Oh my gosh. Very different, you know, my life in and out of the city and, and uh, and so we moved. So okay, we moved so to Laramie. Wyoming. Quick, quick question: <laughs> How annoyed were you that you had to move, or were you open and and like I can find new new experience? Was there a moment where you were like, "Are you kidding me for real?" Like you had just created you had just created all this awesome stuff, and you were getting to the point in your career where you were discovering that you were so much more than a trombone player, and then you had to move. Were you bummed about that? Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> But what I also, you know, I mean, life's messier than that, right? I mean, yeah, of course. I, I mean, I can remember sitting in the driveway and asking, what if, what if I say I'm not moving? Like, do I keep right. the kids? Is she the kids? How does that work? Yeah. Um, but truth be told, is I wanted to be in that marriage, and um, and life has all kinds of unexpected challenges, and we can't change that. There's just right. 
you, know, you can be bummed at that. You know, when I, when I was talking earlier about different mindset where you start recognizing opportunity, part of that is recognizing that which you cannot control. Right. And, um, and the, the truth is that life is a complicated place to live. <laughs> and at that moment, I was moving. And so I continued to run Artists Now for two years, but learned quickly that that just was unsustainable. I, I invented Artists Now for one purpose. Now, it took on many, many, many lives and purposes, and I think it really was an exemplary um, model for what a community-based organization can do. But I, the only reason I launched it is because I wanted my kids to grow up seeing world-renowned artists in their homes as a regular everyday part of life. Okay. I wanted my kids to see, you know, Kim Fisher, principal second violinist, the Philadelphia Orchestra. It's just somebody that came and hang out with us. And, and oh yeah, she's pretty awesome. <laughs> or Eddie Henderson. Eddie Henderson. One of the, this is, this is one friend that will clearly be on a stamp someday. Uh, Eddie Henderson's the first prof, uh, professional African American figure skater. Oh, wow. To become a, a psychiatric doctor and left psychiatry after Herbie Hancock called him and said, Hey, listen, I want you to go on the road with me. <laughs> Eddie grew up in the middle of the Harlem Renaissance, and in and out of his household were people like uh, Billy Holiday, who's his mom's roommate for, for quite some time there, but Ella Fitzgerald and Duke Ellington. And her, his mom danced for Duke's Cotton Club um, show. And so, I mean, and, and my kids saw these as people that were just part of their everyday lives. My God, I, I met Eddie on the radio show, but how we really became friends was through my son, Luke. Uh, Luke was doing a second grade book report uh, for Black History Month and starts talking about, you know, hey, maybe uh, maybe I'll do a Harriet Tubman paper or a Frederick Douglass paper. And mm -hmm. I said, you know, these are really great choices, but there are other African-Americans that we, we, you know, maybe some other kids are covering that part of the the, the history and maybe this. And I told him about Eddie and, you know, he's a little, little guy's in second grade. And I said, well, do you think I could interview Dr. Henderson? I said, yeah, let's, let's talk about what that could look like. Right. And so we were crafted some questions together. And I only knew Dr. Henderson through the radio show. So we were not friends. We were people that had had a, a good single experience. And, and so Luke went ahead and did all the uh, interview questions, did a really great job, super proud of him. And he gets to the end and all of a sudden starts to, to freelance a little bit on his own. And he said, uh, <laughs> Dr. Henderson, I'm playing my, I'm going to read my uh, book report on Tuesday at Irving Elementary School. Do you think you could come and play your trumpet? Oh my gosh. And I'm like, oh, we're off script. And I, I got on there and, you know, <laughs> apologizing. And he said, hey, Mark, Mark, I'm coming in from Italy and I, I land on uh, uh, Monday. I need directions to Irving Elementary School. You know, he's coming. Oh my gosh. So that's he, amazing. Yeah. So we threw a house party that night and, and Eddie played trumpet and it was a way of me kind of compensating him a little bit. But we've had a life of shared experiences since then because Luke was brave enough to do that. And, and now Eddie Henderson, I mean, like Luke sees Eddie as not somebody who's writing a history paper about, but somebody who's part of his life, in his life, in his home, at his school and, and launching a shared project together. And that was why I launched Artist Now, but. But that, that was coming to a close. We moved to Wyoming. So before you go to Wyoming for a second, so with Artists Now, was was the point of it to have um, house parties? Is that what you created, like a series of house parties? Or was, I'm sure well, there's more, but um, tell me more about the house parties because that sounds so cool. Well, the house parties were a way of paying for the community engagement that we wanted to do in the schools. Oh. So what I really loved is that you'd bring these world-class artists to my kids' schools and my kids would get to learn from them and hear from them. And so would their friends. And I was, you know, it was an incredible uh, personal time at uh, in Highland Park when I had some of the best friendships I had in my entire life when I was there. And I loved not only my friends there, but I loved their kids. I mean, their kids were really important. And we had, we had an incredible network of friends and a lot of young people time. And we're at that young age where everybody's trying to, everybody's hanging on by a thread and, and, you know, and bringing a bunch of kids together <laughs> so they could all enjoy each other and, and you get to know the moms and dads along the way was, was great. But the house parties were a way originally of paying for the community engagement. So for instance, if I were to bring in Eddie Henderson and I throw a house party um, and people would, would support that. I still do these here in Louisville, by the way, I still do the same thing. Um, 
that um, and then the model was that you didn't pay for that performance that night, but you did pay for the artist to go to the public schools the next day. So in a sense, you know, the model is that Eddie would play that night for free and, and we'd have this big dinner. And it was always very elaborate with big, beautiful homes in Highland Park and that, that people would contribute and the money then would pay for that artist to go into the schools the next day. And um, so it was a contribution. So I, and people would just contribute that night at the party. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh -huh. And, and the host always covered the expenses of the party because they were throwing the best party of, of the year at their home. And, and, we, but we did them often. We did them, gosh, probably did them almost every month after a while, but it was the community engagement, the schools that I cared most about. It was, is providing opportunities for, for children. Artists now is, is, is kind of clepted from a, a short statement by Picasso that I, that really resonated with me at the time. And, and I wanted kids to, to really, exp to, to believe that they were artists. What's the statement? Now that, do, you, do you remember? Can you? Gosh, you know what? I, I, for your, um, you know, you're kind of your closing, you'll have to edit that in and I'll find it and send it to you. But, okay. you know, it, it, it slips my mind now, but it was, it was really about, I wanted my kids to see themselves as artists right yeah. now. I mean, that, that was the awakening that I had passed through during those years. Remember is that I was no longer just a, a trombone player hoping to win one audition, but I was, you're I artist. was somebody creating ballets and radio shows and, and uh, developing an entrepreneurial pedagogy. And I mean, I, Really, my life had changed, and yeah. Not only that, I, you were bringing together the community in such a really cool way. Artist now was pretty astonishing how we brought community together. But there, yeah. there, there are measures of success that I could share, and I think there are measures of failure too. Uh, six months after I left the organization, um, you know, it came to a halt. And what you know, your listeners can learn from that is when you build an organization that's around an individual, around yourself, um, it can't, it can't. Um, continue beyond yourself. Mm -hmm. And even during those two years when I was in Wyoming, the first two years I was in Wyoming, I was flying back and forth. Um, the organization can, can hold together as long. It was always about me. It was, you know, it's a, it, and that's not the way you build an organization. So I think Artist Now was an incredible project an incredible experiment. The biggest lesson I learned from it was, is that you, it has to be an organization that stands on its own, not a, and on yourself, but mm. the house parties were a way of, of supporting the community engagement. But I will tell you is the first time we did a Celtic music house party, Celtic music's very close to my heart. I've always felt very much at home, especially in Scotland, um, even from the very first visit, but I've gone there many, many times. I used to go and pick the artists that would, would do our, our festival. And so I'd go to Scotland and I'd meet a bunch of young artists and hear a bunch of young artists and then invite them to come back for our annual uh, Celtic music festival. And, always felt like it was a part of my soul. It was just one of those things where you, you immediately feel connected to a place and, and a culture. Um, but when I, we did our first house party as Celtic musicians, what, what changed what artist now was to me away from just a, a house party that funded what I really wanted to do is to impact kids is I could see those adults leaning forward with that same sense of curiosity about, about what was right about to happen. And to me, that was a real eye opener to see adults as curious as the kids that I mm. loved and cared about so much. And, and then artists now started expanding into some adult learning, adult improvisation, adult beginning improvisation, um, and some other ways to help adults reconnect with their own curiosity and to, to become people who didn't just enjoy music, but that, that they themselves were the presenters of the music, that they felt a connection um, and, and they took on a role within it. So the house party started spreading to other people's homes. Other people became much more invested and central to the organization. And that's where we really grew when I, when I started letting go a little bit of control. But, but it, you know, again, ultimately the organization failed because I didn't, you know, too much of it was about Mark Rabideau. Mm. I'm sure we could have a whole podcast just about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I got. I, I have as many failures to fill podcasts as your your <laughs> listeners are willing to stomach. <laughs> we could start a, you know, a whole new thread of this, you know. Well, it Mark sounds like, it sounds like the failure of that organization was really such a um, such an opening for what you know needs to happen when creating something, which is what I'm interested in because. Most people 
operate from, you know, this is my thing and this is mine and we can grow it. You know, that's just what this natural for humans because we're selfish. <laughs> Can't help it. It's part of who we are. Right. And so to what, what that would look like to create an organization in a way that would, would um, survive without you. I wonder how that would look, but I think that's, that's like a whole other conversation. Well, what I can say is when we get to the 21 CM piece of this uh, yes. conversation, it's let's circle back to that okay. because 21 CM is a big idea. And you probably and, and brought a, that in, brought that into, into it while you're, so that we'll see how that learning experience you brought into 21 CM, which I can't wait to hear. Yeah. So next you, so next you went to Wyoming. Yeah. Moved to Wyoming, Laramie, Wyoming. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I resigned tenure. Um, and, uh, you know, stop the radio show and flew back and forth for, um, so, so when I moved to Wyoming, they offered me a halftime position and, um, and that was perfect actually, um, th that I would teach halftime. I really, really, really wanted at that time to begin, um, a new course on social entrepreneurship and I couldn't possibly connect about what that would look like. I just somehow, as clear as it seemed to me that the connection between um, the artistic mindset and what it would mean to prepare people to begin to solve problems in the world that have uh, gone unresolved by any one entity, not the profit or, or governmental organization, was, was a perfect fit within a school of music and within um, an artistic uh, community, but, but I couldn't convey that to the people at Wyoming for some reason. I mean, they weren't ready to hear it and I wasn't, I hadn't developed enough language around it to, um, to, to make it a persuasive argument. And so, so I, I taught low brass there. I kind of was the second trombone professor and, and taught some euphonium players. And how, then did I taught, you, how did you get a job so fast there? So your, your wife moved, wanted to move to Wyoming because she got a position there. Is that right? Yeah, she got a position and, and in a position actually where they granted her tenure upon entering, uh, okay. the institute. So, um, so this was, this was good for her. This was, this was good. She, I mean, good for her personally and good for her professionally that after really feeling wronged at her previous institution, she was able to come to Wyoming. Um, they granted her tenure, which, you know, I think was a very healing thing as well as a, you know, yeah. good security for her. Um, but I think that, you know, I flew out, uh, and they wanted to get to know who I was. And I think they recognized that in Laramie, Wyoming, you don't always get to attract everybody you might want to otherwise attract. Right. Um, it's a relatively isolated place. Um, it, it, but it's a beautiful community and it's a gorgeous campus. And there were really some really wonderful people there at the time. And, and some of those folks are still around there. And, and so uh, I went and I, I did a preliminary visit. And I played a recital and, and did some teaching and they called back and they said, you know, we would like to find an opportunity for you here. Um, but, but there isn't a tenure track position open. Um, wh what do you think about teaching here at halftime? And I, I said, actually, that's perfect because I, I was still doing the postdoc. I, this kind of overlapped when I was still doing a postdoc and artists now wanted me to, to stay on for two more years to, to create that transition to the next leader. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I, I can agree to do that. Um, and so, and I was on the front edge of a thinking about a book project with a friend and that, that could occupy some time. And I thought, well, and my quartet was doing a lot of playing. We were, matter of fact, I think the first week that we started school at Wyoming, I wasn't even there. We were in China um, performing at the first ITA, International Trombone Association. Right. And we still um, got the, we still got to get the story about how your trombone quartet came to be, but maybe we can go into that in a minute because that's, because that's a whole other thing you created. Yeah, that and that's that was awesome. I that was one of the greatest projects ever. I mean, super fun. But yeah, and so I, I thought, well, great. I'll teach half time at Wyoming, and and I'll I'll keep these other projects going. And this was really a sweet spot for me in a lot of ways because because no matter how diverse and and rich and interesting my career is, you know, I, I you know at that time, I mean, still roots were playing trombone and making music and. And doing and sharing that with students, and I mean that I hadn't forgotten about that. And so, the, the second year I was there, the trombone professor left, and I won the permanent job. And and 
another year after that, they granted me tenure. So in Wyoming, that transition unfolded pretty seamlessly on the professional front where I was able to kind of finish up some projects on the East Coast, um, but become part of the Wyoming community even year one at 50% time. And by the end of year three, I was a tenured full full time professor again um, and had reclaimed my associate professor rank. And I'm back at it. Life's good. I mean, on the professional front, the challenge there was um, that on the personal front, things had crumbled. Uh And um, immediately, I remember standing on stage, um, being congratulated with those other faculty members who had just achieved tenure. And, um, and we, you know, we were already divorced by then. Wow. And so, so now we're in Laramie, Wyoming, which is a little tiny community and a great place to raise three awesome kids. You know, the outdoor lifestyle, hiking, and oh, cross country yeah. skiing, downhill skiing was just amazing for our kids. And I lived one block from my ex-wife now where the kids moved back and forth seamlessly. And their school was on our campus. So <laughs> Mary P's office on one side of campus and my office on another side. The kids' school is halfway in between. And if you had to have a marriage crumble, which is always a devastating thing, and it, mine certainly was, um, but you w- were committed to co-parenting in very productive ways, three beautiful kids, this this was not a bad moment. This right. was an opportunity for both of us to to be deeply involved in our kids' lives, um, still do that every day. And, and you know, you can get anywhere in Laramie, Wyoming in about three minutes. Um, you know, a traffic jam meant you were the second car back from a stop sign. And, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's, it, it was, you know, and so, and, and I'm tenured again. And, and, um, but what, what, what I wasn't satisfied about is that my, my, my appointment was very traditional. I was the trombone professor now the only trombone professor now. Um, I was uh, running one of the big bands, which I love like crazy. Um, I was teaching the, the first two in a series of four improvisation classes, but but I wasn't pursuing any of the other things that I care deeply about and things that were really itching at me about really developing a pedagogical framework, scaffolding for entrepreneurial thinking, mm-hmm. one that's find principally at the intersection of the artist, the entrepreneur, and the inventor, a deep sense of curiosity about what is possible um, and the problems that we're be able to identify the problems that we're best equipped to solve. That's really about problem finding and, and about the creativity of an artist and the importance of that, of finding solutions to problems beyond the concert hall and the collaborative skills that all artists and musicians uh, practice every day. But I wanted to make those more overt and the role of collaborative problem solving um, and the implications that had on a more broad scale. And so, so I I had some one-off projects. I hosted a big conference called teaching creativity, what the Academy can learn from entrepreneurs, inventors, and artists. And, um, and, and I think it was a big success. It was, it was fun. 17 countries were represented and lots and lots of people came and it was wildly creative uh, few moments. And, it got me into a bigger global dialogue about these issues, but but um, but I was curious for something more, and and uh, and then a couple of years later, my my ex wife now announced that that she's moving to Louisville, Kentucky, <laughs> and I said me too, um, and so I I resigned the next day. I mean, I I handed in my resignation the next day and said I'd finish out the the year and. This was in March, I guess March, early March, and and uh, and I when I was moving to Louisville, I'd only been there once with a brass quintet for a you know one off, and, and so I didn't know quite what to expect. But but what I did know, and I remember you know Laramie is such a small town. I I had a great great group of guys that I had a poker game with that you know we got together every Friday night and played poker, and and almost man for man, it was the exact same great group of guys that I uh, had a Bible study with. And uh, I remember going to Bible study and saying to these guys, uh, you know, man, I wish I just had more clarity around uh, what I should do at this moment. I remember one of the guys looked at me and said, Mark, you're about to hand over tenure for the second time so that you can remain 
active in your kids' lives every day. How much more clarity could you hope for? Wow. And uh, and I heard that. And I thought, well, that, you know, when you go through a crisis, I'm, when I've gone through crises, you know, for me, it's it's one of the things you have to do is just offload all the things that don't really matter. Um, yeah. You know, we talk about opening up the your lens to possibilities, but part of doing that is really making clear decisions about what actually matters. And what actually mattered in my life at that time were, were just three things, Mary, Pauline, Luke, and Aiden, and that's it. Yeah. And it wasn't anything more. So I, I resigned, um, moved uh, in early, mid-June to Louisville, Kentucky without a job, um, unsure what to do next. Um, but, but I've been introduced to somebody in my life, uh, who lived in Chicago and I thought, well, here, here's what I know is I'll, I'll invent my next moment. And part of that moment is, is a growing relationship with a woman that was living in Chicago. And this is closer. It's a drive away, not a flight away. And, and, and I was open to all possibilities, but also very, um, active in creating those opportunities as well. So to listening to that story, it seems like um, two things I notice. Number one, you had those guys that you played poker with and they were in your Bible study. That is so crucial, isn't it? To have a, you know, a, a community of people like close, close to you that, that are there for support, you know, non-judgmental yes. support. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, Laramie is a small town and, 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 uh, you know, and, and, and divorces are brutal, right? I mean, mm -hmm. what happens is that you lose half of your life. You lose yeah. half of your friend, half of your family, half of, you know, that's the way. There are very few people that fall in that middle ground where they say, I'm going to remain close to both of these people. It's, it's usually people kind of make a choice there. And, you know, I, we're a little off topic of music, but, you know, I still look back at some of those people who, who were able to choose both, both, um, parents. And, and, and maybe some of that impetus is because they chose to still love all three of those kids. And I, I look at that and I think, boy, those, those are the big thinkers in the world, the people that don't start dividing us out apart, but rather uh, holding us close. Yeah. And yeah, that community was incredibly important. Um, but it's impossible for me not to add that, that in my departure, I was leaving that community to go to a town where I didn't know anybody. Yeah, that's rough. But you had some kind of knowing that it was the right thing to do because because you wanted to keep your family unit as yeah. intact as possible, even though there was a divorce, which is, which is great. I mean, you just knew that you, that's what you wanted. So. Yeah. You, you, so in the moment of, I guess the bigger takeaway is in the moment of crisis, you really have to decide what actually matters and what does not matter. Right. And, and, and I didn't feel like at that point in my life that I had lots and lots of choices. I felt like I had a, a narrow, you know, I had yeah. made a small, list that you really stay focused on and that's what I, yeah but, but but i had good advice from people and I'd, i've been here before remember so i yeah you know so one of the things you start connecting with friends of friends um and so taylor harding who's one of my dearest friends who's the dean at the university of south carolina and 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 a and tremendous mentor and big thinker he said uh you need to meet chris stone he's the dean at at the, at the University of Louisville. There was no job open at University of Louisville, but you need to meet Chris. And Chris introduced me to the people at the Louisville Orchestra. And and those people introduced me to other folks. And pretty soon I, I had a sense of what was possible in Louisville. Mm -hmm. um, but what also came about was the University of Kentucky. You know, again, you got to open up that aperture again. Yeah. And the University of Kentucky, just an hour and 15 minutes down the road is another. So I, I reached out to hundreds of schools right within back to back to my two and a half hour driving radius yeah right and and i, I applied for a, you know a million jobs that i probably would have not enjoyed or maybe not even known how to do um but uh, you know what i wanted to do is you know you, you start casting your net in as many directions as possible and my older brother dave who's incredibly entrepreneurial and just has invented an amazing life for himself as as most of my brothers have demonstrated uh, they possess as well is is he said win any job and then make it the job you want it to be you know so he, he just said it doesn't matter what the jobs are out there it's once they get to know you then 
you'll you'll offer something unique and distinct and and compelling and and then your job will evolve closer to your own skill sets. That's great and advice so, and it's like something you already had been doing. Really. You know, cuz you did yeah. that in you did that in in New Jersey when you you were able to to have that position in the college and then continue to do other things in New York and New Jersey that you did and Oh yeah, and the the you know one of the things that I got to do when I was at, at Rutgers was give a bunch of talks, a whole bunch of talks, and I gave them with a colleague who was just a gigantic thinker, dear dear friend, and and the the name of the last kind of season of talks that we gave was based on the Hemingway Challenge, and if, if your readers are familiar with the Hemingway Challenge, it's you know somebody was saying to Hemingway that you know that that all of his stories, you know, the, the language is very involved and, and kind of windy and, and, you know, what does it take to tell a story in a short space? And Hemingway immediately wrote down, um, what is now thought of as the Hemingway challenges, six word, six word story, uh, for sale, um, baby shoes, never worn. And the idea is to create an entire arc of a story that has all of this kind of Allow, you know, unleashes your imagination on, 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 fills in all the rest of the story, you know, for sale, baby shoes, never worn. There's a lot there that your imagination immediately starts to flood to fill in. Mm -hmm. And, and part of that is to tell a, a powerful story in a short space. And, and so I've, I've, for years now, I've asked friends what their six word story is. And mine had come up in this, these talks we're giving and, and that's make life a work of art. And so for me, the, what I've learned through the artistic moment is, is 100% applicable, um, about inventing my own life. You know, what is the life that I want to live? How can I make my life a work of art? And, yeah. and at that moment, it was time again to make my life a work of art. And I was able to connect to the University of Kentucky and they were launching an online master's program in arts administration. And they needed somebody to develop courses in entrepreneurship, arts, arts entrepreneurship and social and cultural entrepreneurship. And I was able to win that job. And that job transformed into a one year appointment as an associate professor, um, teaching in the arts administration program, some of the master's program, some of the undergraduate program. And then the following year, I was able to win a permanent job there as the director of the undergraduate program for arts administration, um, which I loved, uh, that role. And I loved those kids and I, I loved, uh, I would have been very happy to stay there. But at the end of that year, the end of my third year, they asked me to be the associate dean. Um, and I, I thought, well, what the heck? I'm, I'm going to say yes to that. Um, mm. And I kind of felt like I was back now, right? Like I'd kind of circle back, whether that's financially or just in terms of the kinds of opportunities that I could be um, help facilitate the kind of conversations I'd be in. And, and I was going to say yes to that. As a matter of fact, I, I told the dean, I said, yeah. And he said, no, 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 take two weeks, talk to some of the other past associate deans. I want to make sure this is right for you. I said, well, you know, I already know my answer. But And then it was in that window that I got a call from Mark McCoy at Paw University uh, asking me if I would be interested in the position as the director of 21CM. And, and uh, you know, as it works out, two weeks later, I went into that dean's office with, with what he and I both once thought was going to be a very easy conversation. And I, oh. I declined the associate dean's position for the college and, and went up and, uh, or I, I commuted up two and a half hours to DePaul University in my new role. Good, thing, good thing he told you to take two weeks to think about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's no question about it because if I had said yes, I wouldn't have gone back on that. I would have kept to my guns and, and, and I'm, I'm sure that would have been a role that I really love, but my current position is a one of a kind job. Yeah. Um, that would be replicated. Um, and, um, and it's, it, it's, I always describe it the same way. It's the busiest, best three jobs I've ever had or likely ever will have. It's really amazing. So 21CM, tell us about 21CM because I know, I know a lot about it from, from talking to you before, but I want to hear, I want to hear you describe it because it's just culminating from this, your whole story. It's going to be great to hear huh. what, what exactly it is. The work in progress. Um, we actually, I just finished my second year as, as a, the director and I, I'm the first director. I don't call myself a founding director that often because there was a lot of hard work done prior to my arrival on 21 CM. But, but as I culminate my first two years as, as the first director of 21 CM, it, 
it becomes clear that what 21CM really is, is about reimagining how we prepare for musicians for the future they'll soon inherit. And that we really operate kind of on, on two planes. One is how do we help musicians make a living, um, make a life and make a difference through their art and make a living is, is how, how do we help create paths forward where they can care for those that they love most financially? Yeah. And to make a life, you know, most of us think of, you know, make life a work of art, right? Our, our work, our music is our life. Our life is our music. And, and, um, and, you know, how do we help people make a life, um, in the contemporary moment as an artist and to make a difference? You know, what are the ways in which we can reposition music at the center of our communities, um, with special attention to those at the margins where, where what we do as artists helps strengthen communities? Yeah. Um, and then the other part is that we kind of function across two, pl three planes is, is one is the national and, and, um, the national conversation. So how do we uh, help lead this conversation? And there are lots of examples of that. You know, 21cm.org is just one of those. This is a, a, a online journal that attracts 20,000 unique visitors every month to, to hear stories about um, how our most promising future can be realized. Um, and, and what paths are possible today. I hire New York Times, LA Times, Rolling Stone magazine writers for that. I, I do some writing for that myself. Um, there are other academics that we engage in helping share stories there. Um, we host 21 Symposium, which is a every other year gathering of some of the most forward thinking leaders, performers, uh, educators um, about our, our future. Uh, the next one will happen in September, 2018 on DePauze campus. Um, I think this is a profoundly moving moment um, where we invite in folks who are out there in the world doing remarkable things. And the audience is really the academic community listening to people in the field who are really, uh, you know, kind of blowing up traditional models of, you know, the narrow perspective of what it can mean to be a musician in the 21st century. Um, uh, in our community, I serve as the director of, of community engagement where, where, um, I oversee a really incredible team of people who do the vast majority of the heavy lift of it. But that means we have a community music program where 179 kids last year took private lessons, and have the opportunity to, to, to learn from that one-on-one -on -one mentorship that's so prized within our profession. If you're a free and reduced lunch kid, those lessons are for free. We launched a string program in the public schools who would otherwise abandon that. Um, we keep all of the jazz in the public schools because they have abandoned that as well. Um, so what are the best practices in our own community? And then, of course, um, on our own campus, we have uh, seven courses, 21 CM courses within the School of Music curriculum that all of our music majors take. Some of those are about developing personal creativity. Some of those are music entrepreneurship. Some of those are understanding what the state of the art is today and how they can start mapping a, a their own future on a much broader horizon than I once thought yeah. existed. Um, some of those are topics courses um, where kids can kind of take electives within 21CM. And I think a great example of that to me is that we just did a beta test where um, for about four or five days, a dozen DePauw students, um, Nathan Schramm, who oversees Music Cambia, the world's largest conservatory system for the incarcerated. And uh, one of our faculty members, Christina Berger, is a real powerhouse thinker and musician, um, worked with the Meta Putnamville Correctional Facilities uh, on a songwriting and, and choral um, uh, choral project. Uh, that was the template for a new course that's offered for all of our students every spring from here out to, to better understand how our music can make a difference in the world, how we engage people that are very unlikely to walk into our concert halls, namely the incarcerated. Yeah. Um, and we spend eight weeks in the prison system with the men, um, sharing their art and, and, and learning from them as well. Um, so 21CM is really about reimagining what it means to be a musician in the 21st century and, and providing the mindsets and skill sets shared between the entrepreneur, the inventor, and the artist and, and how we can move our ideas to action in the world. Um, so it's very experientially based. And it's guided by a really incredible team in-house at the PAW, some big thinkers 
um, as well as an external advisory board that are very, very hands-on, very involved. Um, remarkable people like Caroline Shaw, who is a perfect example of what it means to be a 21st century musician. Somebody who's a world-class violinist, but a couple, you know, a year and a half ago, I guess now, won a, a Grammy as a vocalist and a Pulitzer Prize as a composer. Yeah. And a collaborator. Everyone from major orchestras to Kanye West. Yeah, and, and she lives. She's from Raleigh. <laughs> she's from here. So, yeah. yeah so she's, yeah, she's girl, it's just not awesome. You yeah. know, and if you ask her about herself and defining herself, she'd just say she's a musician. I mean, in a lot of ways, we're circling back to a day when what it meant to be a musician is is just to be highly creative, not bound by any one yeah, definer. I love that. So tell me, um, so people have access to 21CM resources if they're DePauw students, right? Uh, yes and yes and no. I mean, yes, and as if you're a DePauw student, you can, you know, then you come to DePauw University because you want to, to understand this big, big horizon of opportunities in the curricular space. Uh -huh. But but there are a lot of other resources that, that are very much developed um, for the national and, and international community. And I'll, I'll just give you one example. Um, there are 1,600 music schools in the United States, and 66 of them offer a class that rem remotely can be described as music entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And so you have to ask yourself, why don't those 1,500 and whatever other, number, you know, plus plus, why don't they teach a class in music entrepreneurship? Right. And and some of it might be that schools are still very traditional and, and don't yet see the need for preparing the students for, to invent their own future. Yeah. But the argument there is uh, if you're preparing them to win the second trombone job in the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, that gig opens up once every 50 years. Yeah. And, you know, you really have to ask yourself, are we being, um, are we being honest with ourselves about what, what opportunities exist in those traditional ways? Right. You know, you know, opera houses are challenged to offer the big grand operas that that we think of as as you know the kind of the the, the bulk of that work. But small opera companies are popping up everywhere that do alternative venue small tech performances that are just stunning and amazing. And are we preparing our kids for that kind of thinking? Are we thinking about the the, the explosion of chamber music ensembles that are doing profoundly interesting work? And finding all kinds of ways to thrive as musicians, or people like Nathan, who who have launched a not for profit in addition to playing in the Ataka Quartet, which is I think the most exciting young string quartet out there right now. You know, he, this other part of his world of of working with the men of Putnamville Correctional Facility, Sing Sing, Rikers Island, and lots and lots of other places. He believes in that work, and so right. So I wrote a book called "The Twenty One CM Introduction to Music Entrepreneurship," and. The goal of this book is to simultaneously prepare two generations of music entrepreneurs, students in the class, but also the faculty members across the nation and around the world who know that they need to take up these, these challenges, but don't have the background or the, the resources or the research behind them to take it on on their own. Mm -hmm. So this hybrid flipped classroom where all the lectures are taken online. Oh, great. And what I mean by that. You can read all the lectures or you, at the end of all of this Mark Rabideau talking, still want to hear Mark Rabideau talk more. You can <laughs> click on the button at the top and I read all hundred plus thousand words to you. Um, so the lectures, all of the embedded assignments, the homework, everything is offered within this book. Everything from the syllabus and the grading rubrics, a toolkit of how to's. So that if all of a sudden your kids are launching a project of their own invention, which is the goal of the course, and they need to know how to write a press release, I have a young DePauw student who gives you a three-minute video of how to do that, a button underneath it that gives you a checklist, a kind of a how-to instructional step-by-step, -step, and also an example, in that case, from Ensemble Connect, the former ACJW out of Carnegie. I mean, everything you need is in this book. So what does that do for the faculty member, including the PowerPoint for every single instruction, you know, course, classroom, instructional piece? Um, so what you need from a faculty member there is for them to be brave enough to take on the challenge of of take, teaching a course where they don't yet have the expertise, I see. but they know it has to be taught. And then they guide students over the course of the 15 weeks, not only through the, the discussions around the lectures and the activities that we've built for in-classroom uh uh, you know, engagement, um, but also to help students launch a project in the real world over those 15 weeks, 
where they move their ideas, their original ideas, their own act of invention into the marketplace where something real happens. And and and, and in the summers, if, if you're not fully confident yet, then in the summers, we have the 21CM Institute where faculty member this past year, we did it for the very first time where faculty members from far away as Egypt and Japan and Mexico and across the United States, historically black institutions, community colleges, Christian universities, all came together and spent six really intensive days learning how to navigate a, this course, how to use the book, but also to learn from some of the real experts in the field. Uh, Melissa Snows taught at the at the Institute. David Cutler, of course, was there. Uh, Jennifer Rosenfeld from Denza Artists and Ica Denza. And I mean, the next year, Mary Javian from Curtis will be teaching. Elizabeth Hinckley, former uh, public relations director from the LA Phil, will be there as part of the faculty. And I mean, so. These are resources that we're working really hard to develop for the profession. Exactly. Okay, so you're you're essentially you're creating this wealth of resources for faculty members who so they can then bring this this type of education into their own institutions. Yes, but we also many of the the resources that we're developing uh, particularly shared on 21cm.org are for that 20 or 30 something who's out of school now okay. who's trying to make so e even something as simple as um, last month, I think we launched an electronic press kit um, uh, f for readers. Uh, Brian Horner wrote the cover, you know, the kind of the, the overarching article about the need and purpose and what's required of an electronic press kit. But then we included resources under every single one of those components. So if you have to be able to, um, you know, uh, share, create a music video. We have a couple of articles and exemplars of what a great music video in the arts can look like. And I think our music video that we share, which is of Nine Horses, the Emerging Artist Competition winners from last year, um, uh, we produced a, a, a video for them that I, I think is just off the, I think it's like MTV ready, <laughs> but it's classical musicians, you know, so violinists from Indiana universities, part of that group. And, and um, you know, and, and if, if, you know, if, if, a photo shoot is part of what you need. What works? What doesn't work? If I mean, every element of an electronic press kit, if you're a young person, you're really ready to get your story out there. You've got to cut through all that static, you know, and you want to really present yourself as somebody who's part of the profession. Um, we, we've provided the resource to guide you through all that. We, we, we share stories about people who are really breaking down uh, boundaries of what it means to be a 21st century musician every single month. So, that that space is really targeted towards the people just out of conservatory, just out of graduate school, mm -hmm. and are saying, "Man, I didn't get any of this. Right? Where do I?" And twenty one cm dot org is is one place that I think people can turn month after month and feel as though um, it's a way of opening up your own aperture. Excellent, and i i like I like the term aperture because at least winds and brass player can really relate to that term. You know, it's like. It's funny because I don't think I've ever used the term before until today. And I think about the camera lens, but I, yeah. but we're going to go with your, your thinking there. <laughs> um, right. Opening up your, your, your trombone aperture is, is a good idea. Yeah. For multiple reasons. Well, I love, I loved yeah. hearing all about this 21 CM and I'll make sure to link um, in the show notes, the website and whatever other, I'll make sure I, after the call, just, um, getting all the links that you would want in the show notes so that anyone who's listening now can check it out because it sounds like a fantastic yeah. resource. Yeah. Come to the 21 symposium. You know, um, if you're, if you're a faculty member and you're, you're thinking about taking on the challenge of teaching a, a class about how students can invent the future they want to inherit, then, then I'll, you know, you can share a link where they can get a free copy of the book. Uh, it's an electronic book, and it's meant always to have been such. It will come out in a paper format in January, but um, it, you know, the 21 Symposium, the 21 CM Institute, or just join the conversation on 21cm.org, connect to us on Facebook or Twitter. Um, you know, there's a button on 21cm.org. If you're doing some kind of really innovative event or part of a big new idea, we share those on our Go Guide all the time. We always have, you know, great examples that come in from in that mutual dialogue um, where we share back out to our, to our readership. I mean, 21cm.org is a community more than it is, you know, Mark Rabideau. 
<laughs> awesome. Well, I, I'm sure people listening will have something to share in the go guide as, as they start to create their own endeavors. So yeah, definitely. Okay. Mark, you know what? I feel like I could seriously just talk to you for two hours. Maybe we'll have to have a part yeah. two at some point. So, <laughs> but for now, yeah. I'm going to ask you my final questions. Um, right. so I know you've covered so many different habits, um, throughout this interview about the ways that you think and how you've thought when you've had to make big changes. But I'm just going to ask you if you could boil it down. What do you have one habit or behavior that you feel that you've developed over your career that's helped you the most? Yeah. Um, learning how to finish the following sentence. Identifying needs, gaps, and opportunities and creating innovative solutions for dot, dot, dot. That's great. To me, the entrepreneurial mindset is, is that it, it's a sense of curiosity about identify the needs, gaps, and opportunities that you're best equipped to address and to create an innovative solution or an entity. Um, and then you have to decide what, what that's for. For me, it's always about creating um, bigger definition of the role the arts play uh, in the world today, uh, a bigger definition about what artists can mean within their communities, um, the inseparable relationship between life lessons learned through the arts and how those apply to everyday life. Um, for me, it's about chasing down the idea of make life a work of art. Um, and, and I, 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 I have come a long way from that narrow way of thinking about what Mark Rabideau offers the world. I either succeed in playing second trombone in the Chicago symphony or my role in the world is not enough. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned over the years and, and many times the hard way, um, um, through my own personal and professional failures, but, but also through a willingness to play the believing game where I, I believe that I can make a difference. I believe that my own curiosities and creativity and, and, and collaborative skills ha can have a bigger purpose. And whether that's invite in, inventing the next moment in my own life or whether that's inventing ways in which musicians can see themselves as change agents in a world that's desperately in need. All you have to do is uh, open up your news app in these 24 hour news cycles. And you can see that there's never been a greater need for musicians and artists in the world. People who principally are about ushering beauty into a, an otherwise very conflicted um, moment in our, our shared history. And so f for me, what I hope to keep on doing through 21 CM. Um, but if life has another twist or turn for me, then it, it, in whatever that next moment looks like, is to continue to explore my own attributes of the artist and the entrepreneur and, and to hope share those with others and help them see that their path does not need to be a narrow path from, you know, Juilliard to the New York Phil or from Curtis to the Philadelphia Orchestra. Mm -hmm. But they offer much, much more to the world than that. And if they end up doing that, that's incredible. That's those organizations and those institutions are still profoundly important. Right. But if that's not the path they choose to make, for themselves, that there are endless ways to pursue our lives. And what we need to do is identify what we uniquely offer the world and what we care most deeply about. What are the needs, gaps, and opportunities you see? And how will you invent that future for yourself and for the communities in which you live? So well said. Oh my gosh, I'm just getting chills over here. <laughs> so tell me, um, who in the classical world is inspiring you right now? Well, my board chair, Yo-Yo Ma, is, is one of the most inspirational people that, that I have an opportunity to be up close to. You know, for me, yeah. you know, we, I get to hear a lot of music and I get to go to a lot of concerts. And, and it's always been true that there's nothing like, um, you know, the, the power of live music is that connection that you feel to the artist. And, and one of the reasons I love house parties is because it puts people up close to the artist. Um, but somebody like Yo-Yo radiates, um, all that he loves and cares about and believes in, in everything he does. And whether that's him guiding the 21 CM advisory board, as he did just a couple of weekends ago, or, or performing that evening from the stage with the Civic Orchestra Chicago and seeing the kind of relationship that he's 
uh, developed with each of those musicians. Um, just the way that he radiates joy and hope, um, you know, it's just incredibly inspiring. Um, but people like Awadaj and Pratt, the first African American to ever win an international piano competition, he's the most successful 19th century friend I have. Um, and Awadajan is continually um, creeping into the 21CM conversation because he knows that not everyone will have the remarkable career as a traditional musician as he has. And he himself craves new ways of engaging audiences, new ways of, of pursuing his own career. And so you look at someone who doesn't need to change at all and for them to still be, you know, continually chasing that down, bo both in his role as as a 21CM advisory board member, but in, in loads and lo loads of other ways. Uh, he runs that great program, The Art of Piano in the Summer. It's it's like one of the most traditional, like the most awesome young pianists from truly around the globe come and study with the most awesome faculty you can imagine there. Oh. Awadad, Olga Kern, and all these incredible people. And even there, he's opening up that aperture, that aperture to, to other dialogues, other <laughs> conversations. And I had a chance to spend some time with those students this summer, and it was it was really really fascinating. So the, the people I love most are the people like Yo Yo, who could have played Bach cello suites his entire life mm -hmm. and still have been the most beloved and celebrated musician of his generation. Yeah, but he but he pushes on for more because he sees the importance that music plays in connecting us, in finding our shared humanity. And opening up dialogues that have not been successful on other arenas, not in the political arena. We know that, hmm. not in the educational arena. Right. And and so for me, it's it's always about artistry above reproach. It's never a shortcut. You have to be an artist. You have to put those hours in. You have to, at some moment, had that myopic view that I shared earlier, where you're driven to play at the highest level. But it's those folks who have opened up their lens to a bigger, bigger conversation about. What the arts can play. Those are the people I, I'm just really blown away. And a lot of them are young people like Dakota and Ice and, and uh, Far Cry and all those great ensembles that are doing such profoundly beautiful things. Nathan Schramm with Music Cambia, Mike Block. Oh my God, one of the most creative, inventive, hmm. open, you know, people in the world. He's what Yo Yo Ma calls the quintessential 21st century musician. He plays cello in Yo Yo Silk Road thing. That's an intimidating job. <laughs> but Mike. Mike is just this big, wide open, joyful artist, uh, ready to take on any challenge. He's the founder of the Global Musician Workshop that happens on our campus where a hundred musicians truly from across the globe come. More, more musicians from Syria than Indiana, more from Iraq than California, more, I mean, artists from everywhere come together to learn something about each other's art form, but also to learn something about each other through that art form. I mean, these are the heroes. Wow. These are the people that are doing the best, most profound work in our profession. Incredible. Wow. I love that. I love all of that. Um, I'll definitely link all those, all the people you mentioned in the show notes. So everyone, if they haven't heard of, obviously they've heard of yo, -Yo Ma, but anyone else, they can access websites in the show notes for sure. So, so I know you have an upcoming symposium. Do you have anything you want to promote or do you want to talk more about the symposium and how they can get access to that? Or if there's something else that you want to promote, I'm, I'd love to hear about it. Um, gosh, there's a lot going on right now. Um, boy, oh boy, what, what to share. I, you know, I, a student asked me the other day, like, what, what should I do, you know, to set myself apart? And I'm like, my, my goal is always to try to be involved in one thing every month. That's really awesome. Um, and, you know, to try to challenge myself through that. And so kind of a lot going on right now. I'm writing a little tiny book for a group called Project 440 in Philadelphia. And it's really about helping young musicians see themselves as community leaders. Um, that book will be available only through Project 440. Um, and that, that comes available next year. Uh, but Project 440, led by Joe Conyers, who's just an incredible guy, uh, one of two African Americans in the Philadelphia Orchestra. Uh, assistant principal basis, but he's also the conductor of the Philadelphia City Orchestra and, and executive director of Project 440. So I think when that book comes out, that's that's really targeting young people, not towards a career in music, but rather what they've learned through their lives as young musicians and how they can be community leaders. Um, the 21CM Introduction to Music Entrepreneurship is is really important to me. I'll, I'll make a note here. I don't financially benefit from that in any way. Um, it, it's a it's a project that really DePauw 
um, resourced at the front. And what we really want to do is just help solve the problem that I mentioned earlier. So that's something I really would love for faculty members to take a look at. 21CM Institute is next July 9 through 13 on DePaz campus. If you want to hang out with amazing people like Mary Javian from Curtis, who's just really doing some incredible work at the intersection of music and social entrepreneurship, then that's the best place to hang out with Mary. Um, you know, those are the kinds of things. I, what I would say is get in the conversation, join this conversation. Um, and, and that could be by picking up a book that can be by coming to an event. Um, the symposium dates aren't a hundred percent secured because we're locking in some artists that are really hard to lock down, but, but we, we know when it's going to be. And we know that when you get there, you remember last time I had, uh, Kronos Quartet there as their, as the, you know, kind of Saturday night concert. Well, I've got to do bigger than that. And that's not easy to be <laughs> bigger than, but I think we've got an idea or two. Um, but th that's something that anybody can come to. It, it will be September 2018. Um, and we'll announce those dates, you know, probably in the next month or so. Um, I, I would say, you know, keep it simple. Go find 21CM community and, and like our page. Um, find Mark Rabideau. There are two Mark Rabideaus on Facebook. If you see me dancing with a beautiful woman, that's Mark Rabideau, the dad and husband. That's my wife there. Um, you're more than welcome to link up with me, but that's my, you know, you're just going to see like, you know, my son's tennis matches and stuff. <laughs> um, there's another guy just standing by himself. He's beaming. It's actually, a uh, just me, but I'm, I'm actually on the altar. Uh, and I married my wife, Laura. Um, but it, that's the Mark Rabbit that wants to be in a conversation with you about, about your future. You know, go, go friend that guy and let's start a conversation about your own future and about the future of the students that we that we know are courageous enough to take on this challenge and and talented enough to succeed but but we need to find a, a path forward um together for them to to thrive. Awesome. Thank you so much Mark. I really appreciate you coming on Crushing Classical today. Yeah, this was really fun, Tracy. I really appreciate the invitation. Awesome. Thanks for Thanks a lot. Chatting. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening today. Hey, listen, I have a huge favor to ask you, and it will only take a few seconds. If you like this show, one way that you can let us know is by writing a review on iTunes and subscribing to the podcast. Writing a review will help other people to find the podcast and help us immensely. It will only take a few minutes. Just head over to iTunes and search for Crushing Classical. There, you can write a review and click subscribe. Thanks again.